but it's a really important topic in terms of our debate and discussion. Uh, I think the book is in tune with what's needed. Housing is a basic human need. It's important as the National Health Service and everyone is crying out for a change in housing. And I think we're going to get that support and we're going to step it up and I think we can make the change. Tony's book is just absolutely, the timing is perfect because we're right at, in that process now to consolidate uh, the next stage of the um, manifesto of preparation. Tony's book puts the case for a publicly owned construction direct labour organisation to be created to tackle the housing crisis. DLOs should be a priority, public sector DLOs. <laughs> and now is the time to start fighting for them because we have this massive crisis that's affecting housing and building workers. We have a, a huge housing crisis, everyone knows. And that's across everything in housing, whether you're uh, a council uh, rental um, person, whether you're a private sector rental person, or with your homeowner or a potential homeowner. The cost of housing is, in my mind, totally fabricated. Housing is just the materials that goes into it, plus the tradesman's labour. And if you put those costs together, it's something like a fifth of the typical cost of a house. They're making vast fortunes out of the housing. They're deliberately not building housing, so the price goes up. They're deliberately land banking. As they buy up the land and, and not build on it, so it inflates the price of the land and the cost of the housing. Uh, and in addition to that, it's total price fixing where there is public sector housing, and even pri private housing as well. And they were found guilty in 2009 of that. In Southwark, we lost our work, half of our work, as a result of that secure. We lost our work, and that was a fiddled contract. Mm -hmm. We nearly lost the whole lot. It's only because of the action we took at the time, the demonstrations and the activities we did at the time, cut that in half. We've now got overseas companies buying up properties left, right and centre, and they don't even have to put tenants in them, because all they have to do is buy it, and the value goes up anyway. I'd like to see landlords done away with, actually. There shouldn't be wealth involved in housing. It's a basic human right. Mm -hmm. They've got a monopoly of control, and that's what the book argues. Monopoly of control, which has deliberately driven up uh, prices of all f forms of housing to enrich themselves to obscene levels. Opposite uh, the estate where I work in Islington, there was a, some public land. It was a school, for reasons that are hard to imagine really. The school was demolished, the site was sold to a private developer. Mm. That private developer actually is a housing association. And on that development, there's about 70 homes. And I recently discovered that there were almost as many homes for sale for over a million pounds as there were for so-called social rent. And this is a housing association. And this is the reality of these sort of organisations. Yeah. Unless they restore themselves to their original purpose yeah. as genuine social landlords, yeah. housing associations should not get another penny yes. of public money. Yeah. In my consistency, the Tories have introduced a 10-year um, residential test. So you have to live in the area 10 years before you even can apply to get on the housing waiting list. And the average wait then is seven or eight years. I despair when I hear local councils, including Labour-run councils, talking about people not meeting the criteria to be considered for a council home. And by this they mean a financial criteria. Most of our council houses sold off, not, not all but most. And the irony is the Tory council now is renting back the council houses they sold off 20 years ago at high rent as well. It was fascinating to read in Tony's book just how big Southwark DLO once was, with a workforce of around two and a half thousand, a thousand of those who were painters undertaking estate programmes to decorate the blocks and homes on each of its estates, a practice long since abandoned, which has led to many blocks being neglected and in a state of managed decline, staving off chances from the ever-ready property developers to come along to demolish estates, tear down communities built up over decades to re be replaced with luxury homes most local people cannot afford to rent, let alone buy. We've had a number of councils, including some Labour councils, as we saw up in Haringey, seeking to sell off sites in negotiations with private developers, which always seem to land us with fewer council houses. Um, for, the, for the scale of the property that's been sold off. There are currently <coughs> at least 80 
council estates in London alone that I've threatened with full or partial demolition. And this is happening all over the country, not just under Labour councils, but all councils. Yeah. I've worked on all these big estates and stuff for, for, for 13 years, huge amount of housing. Suffolk being the fifth largest social housing provider in the country, most of them were built when I was young in the 70s. And within 30 or 40 years, most of them have been knocked down. Why? 30, 40 years. I li you know, people live in Victorian properties that they think is great. They've just done them up, adapted them a bit, modernised them. All the wasted materials. It's always that is attack on the environment. There should be no developments whatsoever unless the residents themselves have made the decision. Yeah. The fear that we've got is if these deals keep going on, they've sold off their sites, by the time a Labour government comes in, they've got no sites left. We've got to end the housing crisis by building council homes. But it's also incumbent on the Labour government when it comes in that we promote councils once again mm. to bring all the work in-house, to create these big, vibrant DLOs. There must be incentives for councils to move in that direction and subsidies, you know, adequate subsidies on an ongoing basis for those DLOs to grow and thrive. It also means, of course, sitting down and discussing with Unite the Union about the best way to structure those DLOs as they develop again. To develop national agreements about rates of pay, terms and conditions, about equality and diversity in employment and proper training and apprenticeships. We used to have hundreds of DLOs throughout the country, employed thousands of workers, you know, in, in decent paying conditions, mm -hmm. and they were fighters for the trade union movement. In 1978, there were 500 local authorities employing 163,000 workers. In the first quarter of 1978, there was a 348 million turnover, which in today's money is over two billion pounds. We have a handy person on the estate. It's Mick. <laughs> and Mick does 80% of the routine repairs that need to be done on the estate. So we barely use subcontractors. And as a result, we save hundreds, if not thousands of pounds a year. Think about the savings that we could generate if we reintroduce direct labour. What a fitting testament it would be to our determination to ensure we never see a Grenfell Tower again. If we are able to deliver the reality of a fully public house building programme with decent terms and conditions for its workers, decent homes for all, alongside the recognition that fire and safety regulations can never again be seen as an irritating red tape. We have council housing because it is democratically accountable. One of the fundamental differences actually between council housing and housing association yeah. homes. Only secure tenancies can build communities, communities that can grow. And the best way to build these communities and homes is for a publicly owned construction direct labour organisation who will build with the community, for the community, creating not just homes, but jobs too, along with much needed apprenticeships, real apprenticeships to plug the huge skills shortage in the construction industry. Direct employment will also go some way to ending the bogus self-employment that has blighted the construction industry for decades. The policy has been adopted at the Labour Party conference, mm. which is to make priority to the public sector, built construction, direct labour organisations. We've set a million new homes within the first term, a million social housing in the first 10 years. I don't like these definitions. No. People understand council houses, mm -hmm. that they understand what a council house is, and that's what we should be arguing for, secure lifetime tenancies. They will have environmental standards of full installation, etc., and we will also do that to existing properties too. The rent should be linked to some form of ratio with regard to wages, so they are genuinely, I hate the word affordable, but actually people can afford them, and if they are linked to wages, that gives us the opportunity then of using that measure to actually introduce rent controls in the private sector as well. Community land trusts, so we start taking land into community ownership, but in addition to that, bringing forward a land value tax to try and ensure that we overcome the issues around land ownership and speculation. We end bogus self-employment and the various umbrella organisations. We have to remove all of the anti-DLO competitive tendering legislation. We also need a shake-up of DLO management. It's not brilliant in council-run DLOs, it never has been. In fact, some of the biggest battles we had were the Labour-controlled council. <laughs> they were doing the job of the Tories actually over the yeah. years. We have to end price fixing. We need that public inquiry. 
on the blacklisting. And most importantly, we must do away with the right of employers to re refuse employment when you won a case at Industrial Tribunal, yeah. that you've been sacked for being a trade unionist. We're not just having an inquiry, we're introducing new legislation to ensure that it never happens again and there will be penalties. No company will get a public contract if they're involved in any blacklisting whatsoever. The truth is we're not going to get any of this if we just leave it to Jeremy and John. We have got to build a united national campaign to demand homes for all. It should involve people, the ones that are really being damaged, really being damaged to get them out there on the streets, occupying places. Construction safety campaign had a big influence in bringing down the deaths in the industry. When we started our campaign in 1988, it was 150 a year. And what we did, we sat in. We sat in, 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 in the courts and refused to go. We invaded health and safety executive offices. We fought for the ban of imports and asbestos in this country, and we achieved. It shows when you connect with real people's concerns and vigorously and radically fight for them, you will win. And that's what the book's all about, really. I've run out of them, actually, so I'm going to have to get a second edition. And if enough people plays orders, then I'll do it.